Hi, I'm Richard, the chairman of the OpenSUSE project and technical lead, SUSE. Uh, I'm Adam Williamson, the team lead of the Fedora QA team. And so, like, I guess we need to start by addressing the elephant in the room. You know, I'm from SUSE, he's from Red Hat. When you think of our two companies, I like to think of it something along this. <laughs> and with the red and the green, you can you know, guess who I'm thinking, to Evil Empire. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, but, you know, we're here, you know, with all sunshines and rainbows, <coughs> what could be that bad to bring our two companies together to work on something the same? What the hell's going on? Yeah, this is unprecedented. Well, really. This is what's bringing our companies together. I mean... Does everyone here build software, run software, play with software? You know that testing is hard, right? We don't have to explain this to you very hard, but we will. <laughs> For distributions especially, these are the factors that make our lives hard. Kernel comes out every three months. GNOME 3 KDE comes out every six months, every three months. And we're building an entire operating system out of these bits, and they're changing underneath us all the time. Users, users' expectations are getting bigger for distributions. We, we kind of come from an old world where we did a release every six months and everyone was happy with that, or less often. Yeah. And everyone was kind of happy with that. People were like, yeah, I get new bits, like six months, this is great. Now everyone wants new bits all the time. We have rolling releases out there. We have Arch, obviously, which is a very popular rolling release distro. OpenSUSE are doing rolling release now. Fedora, we do nightly builds. People want new things all the time. People want to get the latest bits. They don't want stuff that's six months out of date. Um, we have ways of getting things that aren't just from the regular distribution repositories. As distributions, we used to be able to have lots of control and be like, no, you can't have a new version of your application until six months later. But now, people just aren't wearing that. They want it now. Leads into this. We're offering, you know, apart from external packages, the distributions themselves are offering them in way more forms and different, you know, builds than we were before. Fedora is split into three editions, we call them, or flavors. Um, <coughs> SUSE more or less has different distributions now, and that's just what we're doing right now. Coming down the road, you know, all distributions are thinking about how can we split into even smaller parts and let you recombine them, which is Red Hat's kind of modularization thing. <coughs> how can we deliver containers, both of our distribution, and how can you put things on our distribution in containers? All of this stuff is going on, and all of this stuff needs testing. So this becomes our sort of test plan. Uh, I think this is one of Richard's, but we, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Pretty much. Yeah. Um, so it just becomes, it's, it, it's a nightmare to even think about trying to test all the things. You really can't test all the things. So everyone tells us, hey, look, you can do all this stuff. You know, this, this is the future of software testing. We've got, um, yeah, sorry, I, I, I don't know why I look, look like looking up there. You can do DevOps, so you can put everything out into production all the time. You can do CI of your software, you can do it in containers, you can do it with Jenkins, you can do it with Garrett, you can do it with Docker, Docker, Docker. <laughs> <laughs> you might want to do it with Docker. This is the way, when you go and see automated testing talks, this is the kind of stuff they're talking about, and this is software project focused automated testing. We don't do that. We're building operating systems. We're building distributions. What we care about is do our things do what users expect from an operating system? We're not building like a code repository where we can run unit tests on it every day. We want to make sure you run an operating system, you get a desktop, a terminal, something that can run containers, whatever it is you're expecting from your distribution. Uh, yeah, so we needed something that does the same kind of stuff that you may be doing at the project level up at our distribution level. And that's really where like open QA comes in. Like we looked at all these other tools and there is just nothing there that does the job at all compared to where we need it. So I mean open QA started back in two thousand and nine. It's quite a mature project now. It started as a, a hack week project within SUSE, so it was uh, one developer, Bernard, pretty much messing around with it in a spare week. And from there it's evolved to this this kind of rather mature project where we can do pretty much everything in it. So it tests operating systems and their applications. I say operating systems, not distributions, because we can test every operating system. It does GUI, GUI and console testing. 
And of course, yeah, we're using it for Leap Tumbleweed, and internally at SUSE, we're also using it for SUSE Linux Enterprise. And of course, Red Hat are using it with Fedora. The main kind of, well, yeah, the main philosophy of it is it tests like a user. This is a totally API independent testing framework. We don't know about the APIs we're testing. We're not scraping GTK or doing fancy stuff with Qt. We are looking at the screen that the user is looking at and actually using computer vision libraries to analyze the input of that screen. We're not touching the software directly. We're using the keyboard and the mouse that a user is going to use. And of course, when we don't want to do the graphical stuff, we're looking at the serial console and doing text comparison because that's why you're looking at the screen. But to give an example of how the, the screen stuff works, it's actually taken from one of the OpenSUSE tests. And we, we have this concept called needles. So OpenQA can take a full screen, a full screen, a screenshot, and we declare an area that we're interested in, like this one around the GNOME desktop box there. And that's what OpenQA is looking for. And OpenQA will actually be able to analyze the full screen. And if this moves around, changes slightly, still be able to find it, still be able to do that match so we can handle small UI changes really, really comfortably. But it does mean that we can make sure that that UI element, that thing that that user needs to be able to see to be able to use that system is actually there. And because we have the mouse driven stuff in it, we can also tell OpenQA, yeah, find that, click in the middle of it, and that will make sure that that radio button gets clicked and everything moves on. So we can do lots of heavy keyboard-driven stuff, but we also can just you know, follow it all along with the graphics. We don't just do graphical testing, so this is a nice geeky output out of one of the OpenQA logs, <laughs> just to show the kind of stuff we're doing with, with string analysis. So here we're yeah, running a script, which is actually being pushed to the machine via OpenQA, making sure that uh, it echoes curl zero when it's finished to the serial console and open QA, listens to the serial console, gives it a couple of seconds to do its thing. If it passes, the test moves on. No point running tests if you don't know what the result is. <coughs> and so with OpenQA, it really does a good job of trying to record and report everything that it's done. So we take screenshots of everything we're doing. Even if we're doing the serial console, we'll take a screenshot anyway because it makes analysis easier taking logs of everything we're doing, both from the system and from the hypervisor or from the, the system under test, so we can have a look at the serial console and see what's going on there. We encode video of every single test run. So if there's a, something in the, in the tech that's not covered in our test language, that's you know, happening completely out of scope and you know, OpenQA isn't taking a screenshot because we have no idea what's going on, the video will catch it. Every half second, we're taking a frame of the video so we can see exactly what's going on with the system. We also can have OpenQA recall, uh, save the ISO and the disk images for reproduction. So the, the images that we're using for the tests are stored inside OpenQA in the web UI where you can just download them fresh. But also we can have OpenQA produce those disk images. So we're using them for some of our, our nested testing where we run through a test run. If this is good, OpenQA stores that disk image elsewhere, which we then use for further testing, for manual testing, for that kind of stuff. And then we put all of this into a dashboard for, for easy review and reporting, like this. And this is the kind of product dashboard that we have for, for OpenSUSE, where we have not only different distributions like Tumbleweed and Leap, but also different types of testing for, for Leap, where we have our maintenance updates being tested. One, uh, the, uh, yeah, the maintenance updates are the very individual narrow tests for an update that we're going to be releasing. We also test like all of the updates together to make sure that we're not doing something stupid there where we have you know, one update in the channel breaking the next update alongside. And just to make sure everything's okay, we also test the stuff we've released. And uh, when I took this screenshot, we uh, had actually had a bad day and actually had broken something in the release channel because we weren't using it as heavily back then as we should have been. <laughs> but drilling down one level deeper, we also then split all of the tests out so you can see scenario by scenario, architecture by architecture, exactly the state of how well did this thing pass in each case. So here we've got yeah, four different architectures, ARM, Power, S390, and x86-64, and this is a tiny snapshot. I ran out at B. There's, there's tests going down to Z for this, uh, for this distribution of, of different RAID configurations, different software configurations, 
you name it, we can test it, and then we show it all up on here. And you can very easily see, not only did it pass, but when it failed, exactly where did it fail? Like you can see here, I can't show it on this map, I'll oh, forget about it. Um, all patterns, yeah, failing with Vim, because Vim was broken on that architecture for some reason. Drilling down a level deeper than that, so you want to, you know, something's broken, you want to find out why. We have another web UI screen showing all the detailed screenshots, exact status there. When you click on one of the red dots from the previous screenshot, this is what you get. Yeah, mm -hmm. or one of the green dots, yeah, whatever yeah, yeah. the dots. Yeah. And yeah, this is showing the screenshots and all the individual modules, each step, yes. Why two different green colors there? The two different green colors, um, that's a wonderful question, good. And I'm impressed spotted. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The two different green colors are because we have passes and soft failures. Um, the, those kind of nasty, annoying, acceptable failures where you really wouldn't like it there in an ideal world, but it's good enough to really ship it. And the example that I took there was a product that was in alpha, so there was lots of things that were good enough for alpha, <laughs> so there was the two different greens. Um, so OpenQA has that kind of yeah, conditional stuff where you can say, okay, I wouldn't really like this, but it's good enough to go through. And that's, that's really important with some of the stuff we're doing at SUSE, where we're like, a actively tying our development process to OpenQA. So if OpenQA says no, nothing shipping. So it's nice to have a way of you know routing stuff around it when it's good enough. Yeah, so you can channel the resources to the yeah. their most level. It's also useful if you've got a test failing the same way every day for weeks and you want to know what happens when you get past that to <laughs> see if something else is broken, right? Yeah. It's like instead of just failing at the same point every day, you can. Cool. So is the soft failure, um, are you saying it's okay for this test to fail or are you saying uh, for this test, this is success, these are soft failures and I can live with it and these results are failures? Yeah, second one. Second one, okay. You yeah. tag needles as soft fails, and you say, okay, if, I, if this needle matches, then this test is now a soft fail, but keep carry on through the rest of the test. Yeah. yeah. Cool, thank you. Yep, and um, yeah, and on this dashboard here, you've got the yeah, screenshots, each modules, and those tabs there for like the logs and the assets, so all of the logs for this test run are there with all of the different disk images it used. The settings, so you can see what OpenQA had in its settings. And the nice shiny new feature on the end there is previous results where OpenQA will actually show you the, the last 10 or so runs of that scenario. So you can see, okay, what's the history of this? Did it break today? Did it break yesterday? You know, where, what's going on with that? Which has you know, proven really, really useful. I learned something new every time I do an OpenQA talk. I haven't seen that yet, so thank you. Yeah, oh uh, well, yeah, because you've only just started using the master. So yeah, it's going to be in the well, next step. We did this step step just before we put that in, I think. I so think, yeah. But yeah, that's, that's, re that's a really nice feature. That's really, yeah. And yeah, we're developing all this stuff quite quickly. Yes? So when there's been large UI changes to an application, does it just fail all of the OpenQA stuff? If there's been tons of UI changes, yes. But um, re-needling is not a difficult process. And in fact, this is a perfect question for this slide. Um, because when there's been a bunch of UI changes, just like there is here, you have a failure, you get a red dot, you click on all this stuff, and you end up with a screen like this, where this screen is a 36% match, and we have this big red box and this yellow bar, this orange bar which is you can slide in the web UI to see what's wrong. Um, so on the right-hand side, you have what's currently in the system. On the left-hand side, you have what it was expecting. And if you move the bar along, what you end up finding is the grub menu totally likely changed. Um, in the case of OpenQA, if that new behavior is acceptable, it's the one button on the web UI to say, yeah, fine, carry on. Save that as the new needle. So it, it's not really that tricky to refresh this stuff very, very quickly. It's all very nice and easy visual to you know do this analysis, do this, yeah, figure out what's gone wrong where. If it's not graphical, yeah, here's the, the logs and assets screen. You can just see that's where we put the video, where we have all the serial outputs, the logs, and um, we're having more and more test modules individually doing logs. So you can see, like, okay, here's the var log messages at this point of the test run, here's the var log messages at this point and this point. So when stuff's going wrong, you can figure out exactly where did it go wrong, and you don't have to like, pass through one massive long log at the end, which might not be lucky enough to have everything in it you need. And so the, the overall architecture of OpenQA, you can run this all on one machine. You can run it on Fedora, you can run it on OpenSUSE. Yep. Hold on, you said var log, right? Uh, the system B does the it throw the a spanner into, into all of this? No, we, we just upload the journal instead. I just used varlog messages because it was easier for me to, to say. Okay. So that, no, no, no. Yeah. I, I didn't <laughs> want it to take a pay cut or anything. Yeah. I was just curious because lots of 
yeah. applications depend on access to those text files. Right? Yeah, but uh, any we uh, with the Open QAPI, we can basically just instruct it any met any log on the machine anywhere can upload to Open QA at any time. So okay, that's yeah, that's no problem. And the way we do all of that is yeah, the Open QA architecture. So uh, on a on a typical production system, what you see is the Open QA web application and database. That's typically one server. That's what's running the web UI. That's where you know, all the scheduling is happening and all the database settings are kept. And then we have multiple physical worker servers. Um, this could be one machine. It could be 20. Actually, how many are you running in production now? Um, actual oh, worker host boxes? Yeah. Uh, we have three, I believe. Yeah, they've, four, got, four. Yeah, they've got three. We've got about six now. So it's, yeah, it's, you know, can spread this distributed. You can very easily add more or remove them as you need them. Inside each of those host boxes, Open, uh, OS Auto Instance is the runner that actually does the, the nuts and bolts of firing up the VMs and running the tests. And you can have multiples of them. So like our, each of our uh, worker host boxes runs 16 copies of OS Auto Inst. So you know, add that together, we've got about 69 test hosts running at any one time. Um, so it's, it's very easy to scale up to huge test plans where you're running <coughs> you know, hundreds of tests in parallel, very, very quickly, able to get very good results. But it does scale back nicely too. All this can run on one box if you feel like it. So if you're doing it in development, I think all of us pretty much just run yeah, a copy of the web UI, one worker, test it all there, see how it works. And yeah, OS Auto Instance is what runs the stuff and connects to connects to Kimu, or we also have support for various other backends. So we do stuff in VMs most of the time, but we have support for real physical hardware testing. We do that over IPMI, and we also have a backend for IP KVM machines. So you just give it like a VNC address, and it goes and controls that. And you know, ideally, it likes to also know where it can get a serial over LAN and power switch. But yeah, we can take over any box anywhere, break it any way we want. <laughs> um, in addition to that, we've got multi-architecture support. So obviously, Intel x86-64 and i586, PowerPC, AOH64, and S390. That's, yeah, uh, we've also got multi-machine testing. That's not just a case of the distributed uh, architecture that I was talking about, but the ability to run multiple tests in parallel where they're talking to each other. So you, you want to do like a HA cluster test, and you want to say, you know, for this I need three different machines, they need to be on their own isolated network, I want them all talking to each other, OpenQA can orchestrate all of that, and even set up Open vSwitch there to actually manage that VLAN, set all that up, and then tear it all down when it's done finished, done, done with it. So we can very, it's not just an isolated OS test, we really can test your application on there. And if your application needs to access something else, that can be just another test running an OpenQA in parallel. Um, I already mentioned the disk image creation. Um, we also have testing without an OS image. So yeah, if you just got a disk image of you know, what you want to test, throw that at OpenQA, you don't need to do the whole installation or an operating system. Obviously, OpenQA is awesome at that because there's nothing else that can do it, but you can skip right past there, fire up a disk image, and away you go. And then the last kind of new feature that's really cool is the FedMessage support, which you know more about than I do. Sure. Uh, FedMessage is uh, some, a Fedora project. It's like a distribution-wide message bus. So whenever almost anything happens in Fedora, uh, it's like 0MQ, if you're familiar with it. It's actually built on top of 0MQ. And it sends out a message, and you can listen to it and do stuff. So OpenQA, the Fedora um, OpenQA instance, sends out Fed messages every time it finishes a test, or it starts a test, or fails a test. And then we can have other things notice that and do stuff in response to it. Um, so yeah, the next point, we're going to talk about OpenQA, how it's deployed in Fedora, why we use it, and uh, what, what it does for us. This is why we use OpenQA. Um, it's a little hard to see. These are wiki pages from the Fedora wiki. And this is our, in, our validation testing for Fedora. <laughs> you can see there are hundreds of little boxes here. This was taken from, I think, Fedora 21. I took these screenshots. All of those tests were done by humans. And we used to do, I don't know, 20, 30 test candidate, release candidate builds of Fedora. And we'd have to fill out all those boxes by hand for every single one of them, more or less. There's some fuzziness in it. But that, that's why we wanted a robot to do that for us. Because doing this 20 <laughs> times a day for five years gets a little old. The glorious present. These are some screenshots from our current. We still track the results on wiki pages, because wikis are awesome. 
All the results, if you've ever seen these pages, when you see one from Coconut with a weird little robot icon next to it, that came from OpenQA. Yes? Uh, you could, as far as I understand it correctly, you could maybe get OpenQA to look at these. So you wouldn't have to have humans look at it. <laughs> 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 yes, that would yes, be we awesome should. to do. Actually. <laughs> <laughs> have OpenQA check if the results of OpenQA are already in the way you <laughs> Yes, yes we could. Let's not. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, the point was that we, we can automate, the idea was to automate these installation tests as much as we could. Um, we've got about 40% of our validation tests are now automated, so humans don't have to do those anymore. Um, OpenQA uses this ridiculous thing I've hacked up to report these results to the wiki that you don't want to know about. The cool thing, tests are triggered automatically by a fed message. We get a fed message that there's a new compose, either a nightly compose or a sort of test candidate for a release, and fed message um, sends that to us. OpenQA just fires up and runs the test on that compose straight away, just in response to the fed message. What are we testing? Um, so we started out just wanting to automate these test candidate builds, release candidate builds, and then we thought, hey, we've got this OpenQA thing. Uh, we can test our nightly builds now. We've had nightly builds of Fedora for a long time, and we just kind of threw them out there. And half the time, they were completely broken, did nothing useful. Um, so we think, OK, so now we can actually test those every day, and we can see if they actually work. So every day, um, Rawhide is the constantly rolling Fedora. Um, when we're going to do a release, we branch off Rawhide and start stabilizing it, and that's, we call that branched. Right now, Fedora 24 is branched. Um, there is a nightly compose of all images from both of those branches every night, and we test each nightly compose. Um, once OpenQA is done testing, it sends out the, the, an email report that's sent out to the Fedora mailing list, and it says, OK, um, we ran all these tests. X of them passed. X failed. Here are links to the failures. So you can follow the lists, and every day you can say, hey, how is today's nightly Fedora doing? And you can find out. The latest shiny thing I've built, which is you can see on the next slide, is called the Nightly Image Finder. Um, so you can go to a web page, which is currently on my personal domain, and it'll just tell you for each Fedora image, when was the last nightly build that worked? Which is a problem people always have. It's like, hey, I just want a Fedora nightly, but I want to make sure it works. And now you can actually do that. And you never could before, so that's kind of nice. Um, right now, when we get to open QA and SUSE, um, Richard will tell you about how they do tumbleweed on the results of open QA tests. We're not doing that yet, but we're talking about it with release engineering, about only pushing things out to the repositories people really use when they pass the test. So that's the next place we're going. And um, one thing that's really nice with our deployment is Richard was telling you about log uploading. We upload whenever there's an installer crash, we upload the, uh, the crash report directory from the installer. So then you can just go in and OpenQA, grab that, and run a single command, and it reports a bug with the backtrace and everything. And that goes over to Brian, and he fixes it. <laughs> so yeah, this is just to, <laughs> just to illustrate a couple of the things I mentioned. On the left, that's the email report you get for every nightly. This is the nightly compose finder. What you can't see from the screenshot, which I'm super happy with, if you mouse over one of the red links, it tells you which tests failed. There's a little pop-up, and you can click and go and see the result. And there's no JavaScript. That's all CSS. <laughs> I was happy with that. <laughs> but, uh, this is also integrated, interestingly, with um, our Auto Cloud, which is a different test system we use to test cloud images. So it shows you open QA failures for most images. For cloud images, it will show you Auto Cloud failures, which is neat. New directions. This is what we're not doing yet, but things we're planning to do with it. Things that, you know, I'm, well, I'm planning to do with it, hopefully. Um, <laughs> Well, the top one we've actually done, which is kind of cool. Um, Anaconda, our installer, has this thing called an updates image, where um, if we're testing a fix for the installer, we can give you an image, and then you boot the installer, you put on the kernel command line, updates equals and some URL, and it'll apply the updates image to the installer code. So it's like a hot fix for the installer. And we made it, I've recently made it, so you can tell OpenQA, test this build of Fedora, but load this updates image. So if we want to see if a change to the installer breaks a bunch of stuff, we can run the entire test suite just on an updates image with that change in it, which is kind of neat. Kickstart tests is a thing the Anaconda team have, um, which is kind of testing that they do at the level of Anaconda, the installer, as an upstream project, um, which runs a bunch. Kickstarts, does everyone know Kickstarts or not? 
Uh, they're like the way you can automate uh, Red Hat Fedora installation. Um, they just have a bunch of kickstarts that are there to test the installer. And the idea is that the kickstart tests a certain path, and then when it finishes, it writes out success to a specific file, or it writes out a failure message to a specific file. So you can see if the test passed or failed. They have a whole runner for this, which sort of is written mostly in Bash, and <laughs> spins up is this crazy machine which can spin up VMs across multiple systems all in Bash. It's like wow. So I thought, hey, wouldn't it be cool if we could run these tests in OpenQA? So in about two three days, I hacked up a thing which runs this whole set of seventy or eighty tests in OpenQA, and then you get all the benefits of OpenQA. You get your screenshots, you get your video, you get your uploaded logs and stuff and you don't have to maintain the power bash anymore. And we're, <laughs> we're looking at whether we're gonna move them over to OpenQA, but it's, it's kind of a cool thing we're working on. Um, testing installer updates. Uh, this again is something SUSE is a little further along than we are. We have this chicken and egg problem in Fedora where, um, so with branched uh, Fedora 24 updates have to go through Bodhi, our update feedback system before they go out. Um, and then people are supposed to test the update and see if it works, and then if it does, we push it out. If it doesn't, we gate it. The problem with that is installer updates. When the update goes out, there's no way for anyone to test it because there are no images built with that update in it. So the only way we can test them is to push it stable, get the nightly images built, and then see if they work. But at that point, we've already pushed the update stable, so if it doesn't work... So we're trying to solve that by basically automating building images with new updates if they're interesting to OpenQA, and then run the tests on them, and then have OpenQA send the results to the update feedback service. So that's obviously a big thing we want to do right now. And testing as a service is, you know, if people want to run, maybe make it so that if people want to run tests in OpenQA, they can send us a test, and we'll just have it run in the Fedora OpenQA instance. Because it's, it's quite easy to set up OpenQA um, for yourself. It's surprisingly easy for such a complex project. And you can run it on a laptop in a bunch of docking containers, or you can set up a pet one. But it's still a bit of work to do, especially if you want to use it in a production way. So we would like to make it so that people can run tests in Fedora's OpenQA if they would like to. Uh, OpenQA in Fedora, it is packaged in the official Fedora repositories. You don't need anything external. There's no side repos. It just comes straight from the official Fedora 23 or 24 or Rawhide repositories. We have a staging deployment and a production deployment so we can throw git builds of OpenQA into staging and see if the tests all start failing or it just doesn't run at all or whatever. Um, they're both running in the Fedora infrastructure data center on Fedora 23. And the deployment is completely done by Ansible, which is what Reland made me, uh, Infra made me do. They were like, <laughs> no, you can't just have a box and install it by hand. You've got to write Ansible plays, do the entire thing. And I was like, OK, fine. But it's actually really cool. And we made it so that we can blow away the entire production OpenQA instance. We can just destroy the machine, run the playbook. And a couple of hours later, because it has to rebuild some disk images, it comes right back up again with all the data because all the, the data is in an external database and the assets and stuff are in a shared file store. So that's kind of nice to be able to do. Will any of those be backported for CentOS 7? Uh, that's an, in, yeah. as in running OpenQA on CentOS, um, it's difficult because all the bits are too out of date. The Perl is too out of date. All the Perl modules are missing you can, in you, CentOS. So you, you can run it on SLES if you want. <laughs> yes, <you can. laughs> it's totally possible to do, and if you would be interested in it, I'm happy to like work on that and help out. But for our needs, we didn't need it, so I didn't do it. But we'd have to have a you know an extra repo with all the updated stuff in it, which is it. We can do that. It's possible. It's just a bit of work to do. Right. Um, I try to make it so that you can use the Ansible plays we use outside the Fedora infrastructure. All the bits of it that are specific to us are conditionalized. So you can take the Ansible plays and just use them to deploy your own OpenQA. And it'll be very similar to ours, but it'll, you know, it, it, so you can set up an, your own OpenQA to run the Fedora test if you want, or to run your own tests. And yeah, we, the way we schedule tests is driven by FedMessage, so we can, you know, run the tests easily in response to external events, image builds, whatever we like. And it's easy to configure that. If we do start getting images for updates, we can just, it's very easy to change the scheduler to do that. And finally, for this section of the talk, this is about um, how we work together with SUSE, because it has been, it's been actually really great working with Richard, working with Andre, the rest of the team at SUSE. It's, it's been a lovely experience. Um, they were really supportive in helping us get it set up. Uh, 
the way Open QA on Fedora came about is Richard did it as a hack week project to more or less shame us into using Open QA. He was like, <laughs> Open QA. as soon as I have hack weeks, then Richard was like, okay, it took me like two days. I have Open QA testing Fedora. Why don't you have this yet? And we were like, ah, uh, we don't have a good answer to that, so let's do it. Um, so then they were very helpful with us setting it up initially. They've been great at uh, taking bug reports, taking feedback, taking patch requests. So this is just a list of a few of the things that Fedora has sent back upstream to OpenQA, and obviously they've been great at reviewing those and helping us with them. Uh, we wanted to have it so that the way OpenQA used to work is that you had to have get the things that it would test onto the server before you start the test, and you had to do that kind of out of cycle. So the images had to be present. And we wanted to make it so we could tell OpenQA, go out here, go to this URL, download the image, and then run some tests on it. So we contributed that, and now you can do that. The fed message emitter, the thing that sends out a message when OpenQA tests are done, that went to upstream OpenQA. I thought I was just going to have to maintain it externally, but they were like, no, we want it. We'll take it. Send us a pull request. I was like, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, we made the thing that lets you run OpenQA in Docker. Um, this is one way you can do your pet deployment of it, and the way most of our guys have it is it's on their laptop in Docker containers, and we sent that upstream with instructions for it. I think it still more or less works, but we haven't touched it for two or three months upstream, so but we sent it up there. Um, we, we did a few little things to make it easier to deploy OpenQA via Ansible, right? Because we needed to do that. So things like when you first um, deploy it and you need an admin account, that used to be you have to do that by logging into the web UI, which is kind of a pain to do in Ansible. So I sent a little script which just creates it. So you can run that instead of having to log into the web UI. And just a few little things around the packaging. And again, instead of just keeping them down in Fedora, we sent them back upstream, and now they're used in the OpenSUSE packages too. So that's. I'm using that for the salt ones I'm doing. Right. So yeah, there you go. It's great. Um, we've made a few little tweaks to searching, um, just nothing huge, but just searches we needed to do. Made it so you can search for like 15 jobs, just specify all the job IDs together to the API instead of having to do it one at a time, which was kind of a pain. But um, we sent some bug fixes, lots of, you know, we fixed various bugs and bugs. And the most important thing we do is we send really interesting and exciting bugs upstream. <laughs> this, is, this is our best contribution. I managed to um, have the production OpenSUSE or OpenQA create, like, it was on a loop of creating bogus jobs, and you got like thousands of them. And I saw these guys on IRC for hours. Where, like, this was a problem with the initial version of the asset downloading code. And I was like, OK, my plan to destroy <laughs> things from within is working. <laughs> this is great. <laughs> I, oh, um, oh, I thought I had a slide of it. There is, in the notes for this talk, there's a bunch of links to those commits. If you just want to see some examples of us all working together in perfect harmony, you can see the GitHub commits of all those changes. Yeah, I've got some links to the GitHub repo at the end. So cool. That's all right. Great. So yeah, that's how Fedora using it. And yeah, now I'm going to talk about how you know we're using it with OpenSUSE. Now, I'm going to start this a little bit backwards because the, the history of OpenQA is like intimately tied with like Tumbleweed. But the, the more interesting place, I think, to start is talking about OpenSUSE Leap. So, OpenSUSE Leap is uh, relatively, well, it's our new distribution, it's about six months old now, and it comes from a unique concept of, rather than building an enterprise distribution, uh, sorry, a community distribution in like the traditional Fedora or the OpenSUSE model of, you know, its own code base and then the enterprise one derives from that, we're actually building a, a hybrid distribution. So we have the SLE 12 code base and we have our community stuff and we merge them together to make a stable distribution. And that's awesome, but it's an absolute testing nightmare because you have two code bases which you know come from two very different places. Both well tested, both work very well in their own environments, but you want to mash it together into one comprehensive working distribution. And that's really <coughs> like the story where OpenQA just works so nicely for us. Because we're using OpenQA at actually every level of this, we're using it for sleep, we're using it for tumbleweed, and we use it for leap all doing the same tests, but on these different code bases, this massive, ridiculous engineering effort of you know, an enterprise code base and a community code base in, as a single distribution, done at the same time as the enterprise part, actually hasn't been that painful, and the result has been a distribution that works really, really well. Um, but yeah, it's, in the case of there, we're actually, well, we started originally doing like 150 odd tests like the whole like full smash of everything we do for Tumbleweed, everything we do for Slee on Leap. 
And actually, after a while, we really, really quickly realised that OpenQA was just wasting its time reconfirming stuff we already knew worked or already knew was broken. Um, so it's actually pared down now to about a few dozen installation and upgrade scenarios on every single leap build. We've just kicked off uh, 42.2 development, and you can already see the stuff in there. And one thing I forgot to put on the slide is all of the maintenance updates for OpenSUSE Leap are, are tested, uh, as you saw earlier, with yeah, as an individual uh, as an individual test. So we have a new package coming in. We'll take that single package. We'll test. We'll do a very narrow test of just that one package in OpenQA. Does it still work? Does it install? Does the services start? That kind of stuff. And then we test again in like the full scope of the whole distribution. Like, so does this new system D trash everything? Maybe, possibly, and if it, yeah. No, no. And <laughs> <laughs> at the moment, yes. Um, <laughs> and yeah, one, one thing that we do differently from Fedora at the moment is this is all tied into our build service and it's tied into our actual development processes. So the submit request in our build service that would go into the distribution doesn't get there until OpenQA is passed. OpenQA is part of that review process. So it's sitting there checking, just like how you get in GitHub with like Travis CI, and that will not check in. And the really nice thing with that, we see like good developer feedback from it. You know, nothing, you know, nothing pisses the developer off more than someone saying, no, it isn't good enough. When it's a robot saying it isn't good enough, the argument's a lot shorter. <laughs> <laughs> robot says no. I want a yeah. t-shirt that says robot says no. <laughs> yeah. If it's a human saying no, you have an argument going on on a mailing list for weeks. Robot says no, they know they have to fix it, and they know that they get it past the test. So it, it really helps keep that thing actually moving quickly. So when we're talking about moving quickly, I have to talk about Tumbleweed. Tumbleweed is, is well, near and dear to my heart. It's why I'm wearing the t-shirt. It's our rolling release. And OpenQA is a, is a key part of that. It's, it's not just a rolling release. I, I really, truly believe it's the best rolling release out there right now. We're doing stuff more interesting than Arch. We're doing stuff faster than Arch. We're doing stuff faster than Warhide sometimes. <laughs> sometimes. Um, but we're doing it more stable than Warhide right now because of the gating. <laughs> And uh, so with the, yeah, with the staging process, so when anything is submitted to Tumbleweed, anything, it gets tested in a, effectively a what-if distribution. We make a new distribution with what if we accepted this one thing, and we do all of the open QA tests on that. If it's good enough, we then check it in with everything else that's coming into the queue at the same time. So we test the whole distribution as one big unit, and then if that's all passed, we, we, you know, we ship it. That whole process, takes about, well, from end to end, let's say about 12 hours. If we just look at the last part of testing all of the changes with the distribution, we've got that down to three hours now. Mm -hmm. So a developer can submit something, we'll test it, we'll give them feedback in a few hours, we check it in, we build it, we test it, we ship it, done. And that is ridiculous when you start thinking of, of actually what you're able to achieve with that. So we have a, a regular mailing list post from one of our developers of like, what happened in Tumbleweed this week. And a few months ago, he posted, you know, we had a quiet week this week. And we only had three snapshots. Each time we do an update, it's, we call it a snapshot because we're rolling out all of these updates as a comprehensive distribution. We don't believe this kind of concept of drip feeding one package in another. You know, if we have 20 things to change, we do those 20 things as one nice unit. So we had three snapshots. Those three snapshots contained a total of 146 package updates in a week. 15 new packages were put on the DVD. To make room for those 15 new packages, we had to take out 38. <laughs> uh, one new kernel, 118 different tests in total. That's quiet. That's what we call quiet now. We realized, we realized in this slide, like, that's a crazy pace of change. That was six months ago. When I was doing this slide deck, that week we had five snapshots. 370 changes. Two new kernels, which was actually low for that week. We've been averaging three kernels for the last two months. So as soon as upstream kernels do something, we're there, we're merging it, it's in there, it's tested, we're shipping it. We had 4.5 a month before Arch did. And it's worked. And it, no, nothing caught fire. OpenQA made sure that thing worked. We had GNOME 320 a week after its upstream release, which is faster than everybody else apart from Fedora Warhead, who threw it in straight away. And yeah, all tested with the same stuff. So it, the process really works. The tooling lets us do all of this stuff at a ridiculous pace, but the users only get stuff that works. So much so that it can be 3 o'clock at night. We don't press a button anymore. OpenQA publishes the working DVDs. 
We trust it that much. We trust it so much that Susan Lit's enterprise is now built using OpenQL. So we have an enterprise distribution where we've, we've taken the same staging process that we have for Tumbleweed, so every check-in that our enterprise team are doing gets gated in that same way, gets tested by OpenQA first. If it's good enough, it ends up in what we call the build, and that in essence will almost be described as a rolling enterprise release now, which is the internal SUSE, internal SUSE builds, which we test and we validate actually about five or six times more in depth every build than we could ever do manually. Like the entire QA team at SUSE, if we were lucky, could maybe test 70 or 80 scenarios in a few months period. We're testing twice that every day for two, two or three times a day sometimes. So we're really getting a much better scope of this stuff is working and when it breaks, we know why and where and how and exactly which part of the things all gone horribly wrong. So when now, if you're, if you're following SUSE closely and like you're involved in the SUSE beta programs or stuff like that, and in fact for SLE 12 SP2, we're gonna have a public beta again for the first time for a really long time because you're only gonna see those beta builds, those milestones, when OpenQA says it's good enough. So you know, we'll be handing it out to customers and beta partners where we can say, okay, we think this is pretty good, it's passed all the regular tests, you know, go find the really nasty stuff we haven't found tests for yet. And then we want to use that feedback loop to make this testing even, you know, even more detailed. And also in terms of time-wise, when you take into account like business schedules and stuff like that, there's some tests like really long running performance tests and the benchmarking and blah, where we want to do that later, don't want to waste two or three days for that stuff. And that's what we call post-validation. And we don't do everything in, in OpenQA with post-validation. We have a Jenkins instance and a few other bits and pieces, but more and more OpenQA is just kind of taking that stuff over because we have the dashboard, we can see this stuff. We might as well have one place to look at it all and run it all in there. So the, the kind of whole family ends up being more like this, where we've got, yeah, Tumbleweed, the sort of the very big distribution with 8,000 packages, all moving at a ridiculous pace. Leap, which of course is based on SUSE Linux Enterprise, but that shared core isn't exactly the same. We take the same sources, but we you know, build it separately. And then SUSE Linux Enterprise speeding on as it does. But what about the future? Well, we've got a whole bunch of stuff being baked. This is kind of, most of this is already actually in our Git repo now, and in fact, in the case of SUSE, we're running it in production, and in fact, you're probably most close to most of it, you're running it as well. Um, we do do stable releases, but quite often because things are moving so fast, we're you know, eating our own dog food very, very early on. Um, so we have a libvert backend. So instead of doing just plain Kimu, this libvert backend means it's much easier for to do multi-hypervisor testing. This is a KVM, Zen, KVM for System Z, mm -hmm. VMware, Hyper-V looks like it's going to end up there sooner or later. Um, so we yeah, want to be able to run all of this stuff in there. Especially for some of like our Windows tests where we're doing like dual boots and we want to you know, make sure Windows works in Hyper-V and then dual boot SUSE next to it, make sure that all works. The IPMI backend is, is growing and being a bit more advanced. So originally it would only work with like one brand of Supermicro cards <laughs> because we literally reverse engineered the Supermicro uh, IKVM protocol. Um, <coughs> and now we've discovered how to reverse engineer another one because um, <laughs> they don't keep anything consistent. Um, Dell IDRAC, uh, Intel vPro, we're, we're looking at adding more and more sort of different you know, out of band adapters to that. We've also added this new work, review workflow. So the, the previous versions feature we talked about earlier is part of that, um, but we've also gone to this approach of, of being able to tag issues. So those red dots you see on the dashboard, you can add a comment to it now. That comment could be, you know, hey, open your race broken, um, or a bug ID. That will then flag up an appropriate icon on that dashboard. Makes it really easy when you're reviewing. You can see exactly what's broken, where, when, how. Um, but the really nice thing with that is we've just added a new feature which also has OpenQA automatically look at the new issues, look at the previous issues, figure out, okay, I'm breaking at exactly the same point with pretty much exactly the same needle, probably the same bug then, and carries forward the comment automatically. So we don't even have to have humans reviewing this all the time, every time. It can do the, the it can, you know, pretty much automate its own review, so you're only having to actually have humans looking at the new bugs that it doesn't understand about, which is really nice. Um, and then when you're doing all of this testing at a ridiculous scale and everything's really quite complicated, um, you end up with a point where your system 
has tons of builds, tons of ISOs, tons of logs, and you've got to clean it up somewhere. You can't just keep the history of the universe everywhere. for everywhere. Um, so we're, we're adding a feature for build tagging, so you can say, okay, this build is an important milestone, it's an alpha, it's a beta, it's, you know, it's something relevant that I might need to go back to six months from now, and that's just there so like the open carry cleanup tools won't go trashing it, deleting it, and you know, keep it there for prosperity. So useful in certain regulatory environments too, because we have like SUSE partners interested in using it, and they don't want their data disappearing because of curate about like deleting it. Oh, 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 moment. Yeah. Oh, and also we have a uh, during runtime we also have a another issue of if you're testing mm -hmm. one build and a new build appears, so you know, Fed message gives it a ping, OBS has a new version in it, whatever. Currently, OpenQA will obsolete the current running build to test a new one. The logic being is, you know, well, what's the point of this old one? I have something new and fresh already. That isn't always true. For like a milestone build, you know, you might be saying, this is going to be my next release I'm going to give to customers, even if <laughs> I've got a new one already, that, you know, yeah. baking already. So the build tagging will also control the scheduler to make sure that the important builds get tested, get complete, you have a full picture of what that's meant to be, and then it moves on. And what else we want? Well, what else we're going to put in there? Whatever you want. This isn't just us doing this for the sake of it. We want other projects to be using OpenQA too. We want other distributions. It can scale out applications. We really want to see more and more people contributing to this, helping us out. It's been really helpful having us working together from different angles. So, yeah. yeah. If you're a distribution, then really look at OpenQA because it is really nice. It's, we, we'll help you, they'll help you. We want more people who are a wider ecosystem. We want more contributors. We've had Meiji looking at it. We've had who else has been looking Debian at it? Debian have been Debian kicking around a bit of it. Yeah, there's a few yeah. arch guys who are really jealous of the stuff we're doing, so they're, they're looking at <laughs> yeah. it. So, yeah. yeah. But yeah, distributions and even yeah, even other places. We can see it being used you know, quite a few other, uh, yeah, in a few other scenarios. No one were talking about it to me today, yeah. actually. Yeah, yeah, sure, yeah. Like, they already have their own internal known continuous system which is a really good job of like the base layer, but they have no way of knowing if the UI looks good. And it's known, I mean, they need to know if the UI looks good. So <laughs> tagging on OpenQA in the end, yeah, yeah would be like the per perfect start for them. They know if they have a button with a given label, but they don't know if the button suddenly turned pink. Basically. Yeah. It's like, they, just, they have no idea. Okay. Yeah, so there's the, yeah, the website where we're on GitHub, documentation, and uh, the moment we have all the uh, features in uh, uh, Redmond instance funded by OpenSUSE as well. I want to move that at some point because I don't yeah. really like it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions? Yes. So I've got a couple. Uh, so if you just want to use it to just test an application, is it easy to set that up? I mean, if you're not testing a whole distribution? Yeah, it, it would be. I mean, you'd have to start writing your test suite from scratch, but there's plenty of examples from others to you know, get you bootstrap with that. Right. And so and you can have it, uh, can you have it move through the menus on like a web app? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And uh, if I wanted to set this up for where I work, how crazy is it to set up like a, a larger infrastructure to get it all distributed and stuff like that? It's not okay. very difficult at all. Yeah. I mean, we added a new worker host last week. We got a big new box we can use to host more workers. We plugged the box in, gave it a host name, ran the Ansible play on it, and the workers popped up. That was okay. Yeah. Sweet. Yeah. And we we do the same with Salt and it's yeah, yeah. the same steps. It's nice. not difficult. Yeah. And does it test itself? We d I did that as a hack week project as well. It's not running in production at the moment because I've been lazy, <laughs> but we do have example tests of OpenQA testing OpenQA. Yes. OpenQA is not always the right thing to test everything. So the unit no, tests for OpenQA are regular for you know, unit <laughs> tests and there's some selenium for the Web BI, but you can do it. You yeah. can do it. Yeah. yeah. What's that test suite written in? <laughs> <laughs> Would you like to answer this? Yes, okay, because I'm a good person to answer it. The bad news is they're written in Perl. But wait, the good news is it's almost like a pseudo language. There's a kind of, uh, there's an, almost an API for the test, and you can do most of the basic operations for a test. It's something like, the language is like, um, you know, type string under string in quotes, and a certain click, which means check that there's a needle there, and then click it. And when you get into doing more advanced stuff, you might actually want to write some Perl subroutines for your case, but you don't have to get into that straight away. It's 
to just get up and running and do some basic tests. It's like this little pseudo language almost. It's, it's, it's really easy to do. And we, we pretty much have a rule between us. Like if we're, if we're having to write nasty bits of code in our tests, yeah. like once we've done that, like the same thing, like five times, it's going in the API. Yeah, like we send this, it. You know, yeah. there's the, you know, we're none of that. Fair. We want the test to yeah. be easy to read, easy yeah. for people to do. One, and that's actually one of the reasons why we stuck with Po because of the lo the logic of quite often. Should I see if I can pull up some? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, the the test writers are rarely developers and much more coming from a sysadmin background, and therefore Po, you know, it's a, it, you're more likely to have somebody you know with that knowledge able to work in that way and you know just think in that mindset. So. It's working out pretty well for us. We do have, I mean, if we're looking at their kind of testing of the service, we also have other frameworks like Two Pence uh, okay. inside SUSE, which can take any language and run that test. And we can run Two Pence tests inside the QA. So, yeah, if you want to nest it that way, you can do, you know, have a small little wrapper for the you know, test framework like Two Pence and then just throw mm -hmm. it in oh, there we go. Ruby, Python, whatever, and away you go. Yeah, I was about to ask, is there so any this is good examples of <laughs> yeah, there this? Yeah, we go. This is a fairly simple open QA test. Um, this is one of Sousa's. Uh, and I mean, you can see that this is technically Perl, but it's like, mouse hide, I wonder what that does. X11 star program, I wonder what that does. A search screen, this isn't you know, rocket science to, to deal yeah. with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're pretty nice and clean one. There's a few old bits and pieces we've tied it up as well that you don't need. Yeah. It still works. Yep. How often does something uh, slip through the cracks in OpenQA and um, large bug ends up in production? How often would you say? I mean, in I think you're better to answer that because yeah. we, we aren't doing as much coverage. In, in well, tum we both in, answer, yeah. in, I mean, in, in Tumbleweed, we haven't had a major distribution break for two years now. Like, you know, we just don't ship it. Mm -hmm. You know, the distribution works. Um, so, you know, a few a few rough edges in, in you know, certain places, edge cases with certain bits of hardware sometimes, because we don't test, you know, infinite hardware everywhere, but the distribution works. Um, there's, a, there's always going to be like one or two bugs which are just really annoying that, you know, weren't in the test plan at all and swing, swing through. Um, I'm trying to think of the, the worst one that struck us. Going back to the slide, like, testing is hard. Yeah, testing <laughs> is hard. I mean, I'm just, there's, there's, yeah, there's, there's sometimes some annoying examples, but normally it ends up being a local issue which we just didn't take into account. So, you know, the user did something that was out of scope of what we, what we assumed in the test. So we just make the test more complicated in the future and you know, cover that too. It's kind of a perpetual cycle of finding interesting yeah. things and adding test form, like any kind of software testing is really. I mean, you write a unit test and you think you've covered everything and then you get bug reports like, oh yeah, think of that. And it's the same. It's the yeah. same with the distribution one. But, I mean, I would say, well, I have proof with sleeve releases embarrassing proof because there was, I, did, had, I had manual tests where I made mistakes and missed stuff. Um, and yeah, open, open QA has made less than me if I look at the stats for the last, <laughs> the last <laughs> sleeve. So yeah, it, it's, that, that's a good measure, I would say. On the sleeve side, it, it's, yeah, it's being more consistent and coming up with more results. And then you know, manual, it also frees up your manual testers to like, dive down those like, weird, nasty things, which yeah, might only hit one customer, but you don't want that either. Uh, pretty much the same for you? Yeah, like we have, honestly, Susan has been doing this longer than us, the open QA thing. <laughs> We've been, we have less coverage than them and we don't have the gating, right? So it's like things don't slip through open QA, open QA finds them post hoc. But the best coverage we have is the installer. And I mean, Brian is from the installer team. With open QA, with kickstart tests, our Anaconda has gotten hugely more reliable than it used to be. As I was saying earlier, with the nightlies of Fedora, it used to be you only trying to install a nightly if you wanted to shoot yourself in the foot. It was not a smart thing to do. These days, I just kind of tell people confidently, say, if you want a fresh thing, go to my nightlies page and grab the latest 24 nightly to pass the test, because I'm pretty confident it's going to work decently. It, generally, yeah. Anaconda isn't the reason why Rawhide's broken. Anymore. Yeah, anymore, and it it's always used to be. It always used, yeah. Depend on yeah. So now we need to get down and finish testing the things that come after the Anaconda, but the, the installer testing, it's, it's been really great for us for that. It has so made things measurably more stable. So hopefully I'll, I'll, I'll see less random crashes of Anaconda when I do things in the UI. And um, you should be. Well, it is written in Python. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Until we do the rewrite in Haskell, I'm not sure. <laughs> more question? I think we had someone else with a question. I saw another hand up earlier, anyway. I, you know I, I do have a, a funny comment. Uh, Go on. Maybe, maybe not we so like funny, funny right? <laughs> so, so Sousa and uh, 
and Red Hat are getting on uh, on to build this uh, Skynet system, right? Yeah. <laughs> All you have to do is figure out how that thing can fix the bugs too, right? Well, yeah, <laughs> for I mean, you. Before, and before fixing the bugs, I, I, I really reckon if I had enough time, like we could probably teach it now to how to play Solitaire. Yeah. And if we can teach it to play Solitaire, yeah. then it will be chess, then... <laughs> so yeah. so yeah. the end of the world starts when Ubuntu starts using it too? Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's just the end of it, right? Yeah, yeah. possibly. Yeah. We'll, we'll, have to, we'll have to put some kind of protection in there for that. So. <laughs> Comment out global thermonuclear war. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Uh, could you show me the robot head that Coconuts uses? I just want to see the icon. Oh, um, <laughs> that's buried down in, where the hell is that? Oh, that's in the media wiki templates somewhere. That's going to be fun. Okay, someone else ask a question while I try to figure that out. All right, <laughs> next question. While he's, while he's looking for that. Can you talk a little bit about the OpenCV integration? Um, yeah. How, how that was to, to, to find and, and use? Uh, I, I'm not the best person. It's been in there for so long. I'm, I'm, I've always just used it. But I mean, it's it's tiny CV. We've got yeah, tiny CV sitting in there. Um, we're we're again, using it with, with a few custom modifications, mostly to like make it like somewhat colorblind and, and you know a little bit fuddier than it normally would be. Um, so like if uh, yeah, we if the, we wanted to be able to capture like if the font changes, it fails. But you know, if the anti-aliasing is a little bit off that day, it still goes through. So there's, there's an element of fuzziness in there. Yeah, so and, and, yeah we're, I think we're up to is it OpenCV three now. Yeah, we just moved it up to OpenCV three a few weeks ago. Um, yeah, just sits there, works, does the job. It's it, yeah, we, we 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 use it in such a simple way. Like uh, I think that, uh, yeah, we have a, a fun story. We also do audio testing. Oh yeah, that's Which awesome, I love brilliant. that. So the <laughs> way we used to do it is we used to play a, a DTMF tone, like a touch tone uh, thing in, in the system under test while listening to the sound card in the VM. So we could then just you know, hear it do beep, 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 and you know, know it was the same thing. We found that was rather inconsistent because if the system's under tons of load, the VM does some weird sound output sometimes, and you know the tone gets cut off a little bit early, and it's just, just a generally a mess. But you know, you know it was coming out at the right pitch; it just might not have been exactly the right length. So yeah, one of our guys wrote an audio to image converter. <laughs> so it takes yeah, plays the audio, makes a spectrograph about the output, and then we take that and do OpenCV analysis against it, and it handles the fuzziness. It works wonderfully. We we even messed around with like. You know, playing music tracks like you know, he's a big Queen fan. We we, we will rock you. Played live, played in the studio, so and played by a cover band. band. And the I studio version drew. and the live version matched. I used to the cover band fell. Yeah. <laughs> 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 so that was that was pretty good. We've been using it in private chat for a long time. We're still just using it for touchdown. Yeah. Yeah. The character's name is Michigan J Robot. Okay. I'm glad I know that now. And you have her permission to use it. Thank you. <laughs> I think I think I checked the license when I grabbed it. There's no license. Was there no? no. <laughs> I guess I didn't. Awesome, but it's being used as well. Any more questions? No? Okay then. Thank you very much. Perfect. Yep, thank you. Very much. Back to work. Back to work, yeah. Back to work, yeah. Yeah, that that piece is a feature. That's what all of us were working on before. Yeah, it was what Ollie was working on. I do that many people. Yeah, exactly. And if you go... Adam, Tom Gilliard. Yes, I know. I saw it.